Over the course of a lifetime, without even thinking about it, we consume and rely upon thousands of products, from the mind-bogglingly complex to the elegantly straightforward. These everyday things are the culmination of brilliant brains working across history in cutting-edge science and design. Beat the horn! I'm Zoe Laughlin, designer, maker, and materials engineer. That's the nylon. And I love getting under the skin of the things we take for granted. I've studied them, but now I'm going to make my own versions. That looks surprisingly toothbrushy. To truly understand how form, function and materials come together... There's a bit of a smell. ..by pulling apart three seemingly ordinary but classic items... Oh before crafting my own designs, step by step. Release the balls! Oh, crikey. Vacuum on. Yes. And constructing something truly bespoke. They're mad, but they're mine. In this programme, I'm taking on an item I cannot live without. Headphones. This is something called an electrophone. This was the first personal listening experience. They harness the intricate engineering and complex technology that drives large, powerful speakers. Oh. Suddenly, it does feel like finding treasure inside, but in miniaturised form. If you very gently push down on there, you can feel there's a suspension system. Four pins of, of this material and a couple of AA batteries would lift a car. The result is an extraordinarily intimate experience. All right, Head, brace yourself. This one's going to be loud. <gasps> that transports us to other worlds. Oh, I'm in Jurassic Park. That is impressive. Can I capture this amazing technological alchemy? Ready? Yep, ready. Let's go with the sounds. In my own unique pair. Starting to feel a bit headphony. There are essentially two families of headphones. The over-ear headphone or in-ear earphone. I like the earbud because of its discreet profile. And then if I'm in a busy office environment, you just want to put your headphones on and be on your own. Globally, 12 pairs of headphones are sold every second. They combine the ingenious worlds of electrical engineering, acoustic science and cutting-edge design to create a uniquely personal sound system for us all. There's ones where the bar across your head is designed to be incredibly flexible. And then there's ones where it's designed to fold so it can travel as a more neater package. These are noise cancelling headphones, so they're designed to provide an even more secluded audio experience. This sort of shape is quite common with a little rubber cup there, or you'll have a sort of firmer bud like that without any kind of squishy material. This vast array of features is relatively recent. I want to find out about the origins of the humble headphone. How has technological innovation led to the rapid rise in little more than a century? Hi, John. I'm Zoe. Hi, Zoe. Thanks. John Cannenberg is an independent curator of cultural audio exhibitions. Ah, calling coming on 653. Hello, caller. How are you? Yes, I can hear you. Loud and clear. I'm meeting him at Amberley Museum in West Sussex, where their Connected Earth exhibition is home to some of the earliest examples of headphones in the world. So it was at the telephone exchanges where the headphones really got their start. Originally, the exchange operators were sort of locked in one position. They had to speak into a microphone that was mounted to the wall in front of them and hold a receiver up to their ear. So they really could not move from side to side at all. Not possible at all? No. Telephone exchanges like these were only possible thanks to inventors like Alexander Graham Bell, who in 1876 patented the first speaker. However, the amount of equipment the operators had to juggle meant two hands were never enough. In about 1881, a man named Ezra Gilliland, who worked for both Bell Telephone and Thomas Edison, came up with this configuration of a band over the head and two speakers on either ear, which eventually became the modern headphone. So even though here they're still tethered to the building, actually they are hands-free, which is, must have been a great leap forward. Definitely. It was a big advantage in the workplace. These headphones used the basic principles found in any speaker of converting an electrical signal into sound waves. 
Wealthy homeowners were quick to see their potential as a way of revolutionising home entertainment. This is something called an electrophone. It's a British product from 1895. This was a device used in the home to listen to broadcasts of things like the opera or the theatre, and it was broadcast over telephone lines. Live? Yes. This was before the invention of the radio? Yes. This was sort of the first personal listening experience in the home. The way this worked was you would hold it by the handle and put the speakers over your ears. Made from strong and durable steel, an alloy which had just begun to be used in mass production... That actually have quite a lot of force. It feels yeah. These stethoscope-like contraptions opened the door to a whole new world, but they were hardly portable. Uh, there was a wire that was attached to the table. I guess the people having this would have been incredibly wealthy. Oh, yes. The King of Portugal installed one in his palace so that he wouldn't have to walk to the local opera. Wow. John's brought along some more historical gems for me to see. The 20th century saw the move from clunky home contraptions to something offering far more freedom. These are from 1910. They're considered to be the first modern headphone. They were invented by an American named Nathaniel Baldwin. He invented them on his kitchen table, allegedly. Baldwin was an electrical engineer who had the idea of making hands-free headphones for the home market. Uh, no one was really interested in investing in them at first, but he managed to sell 100 pairs to the US military, but he forgot to patent them. And that led to him essentially dying penniless. It's really heavy, surprisingly heavy. Is this Bakelite? Uh, yes, it is, actually. Invented in 1909, Bakelite was a revolutionary plastic used in everything from kitchenware to children's toys, thanks to its ability to be easily moulded into any shape. Each one contains a speaker and allegedly one mile of copper wire. And I spy a modern jack. That's a really good example of something I would see today on a device. It's a mono jack, though, yeah. so they're... One band. Stereo didn't enter into the picture until these. Oh, yes. These were invented in 1958, and they were invented by a man named John Koss in, actually, my hometown of Milwaukee. And he was a big fan of jazz music. Koss's early models were nothing more than mini speakers covered in cardboard and sofa foam, but they had two separate signals, one going to each ear, giving listeners their first stereo sound experience. 1958? Yes. Perfectly timed for pop music, personal relationship to music in the home, right. children upstairs listening to noisy records, parents saying, don't want to hear it, put your headphones on. Definitely. And he, he took advantage of, of this explosion of youth culture and, and uh, rock music. What an amazing artefact that forms part of the history of music, let alone the history of headphones. At this point, music lovers were still tethered to record players in the home. But a more exciting leap forward was on the way. So here we've got two examples of the famous Sony Walkman. All about portability. Right. It was 1979, pop music was everywhere, and young people wanted a dynamic, active lifestyle. This was sort of the, the advent of being able to take your music with you everywhere you go. The headphones themselves were, were very distinctive, and they became sort of a, a, a fashion statement to see people with these either orange or, or black uh, foam pads on their headphones. These headphones are incredibly light. Stripped of the heavy outer casings and with miniaturized speakers, they were the most lightweight, versatile headphones ever seen. They're only 45 grams. So stereo sound on the move, basically just a hairband yeah. with some speakers on. Wow. By the end of the 20th century, innovative new developments were arriving thick and fast, transforming not only the quality of the sound, but bringing the freedom to listen any time, any place. Dr. Amar Bose was on a transatlantic flight. He wanted to listen to some music, and the flight was so noisy that he couldn't hear any music. So on that flight, he started coming up with ideas, and by the time he landed, he had a working model for noise-canceling headphones. Next came Bluetooth. Launched in 1999, it allowed us to completely untether. Oh, I so, like it. Yeah. With its own dongle. 
So in fact, now your headphones and your device don't have to be connected. Right. Before earbuds delivered a full audio experience in the smallest of packages. 20 years on from the first noise cancelling headphones and early Bluetooth technology. Um, technology that is this large now fits into a package this size. Yeah. But essentially, the, the speaker technology inside here is relatively unchanged from those telephone operators that we were looking at. So it's just smaller. Right. Before I can make my own unique pair, Jazzy. Strong look, these ones. I need to get to grips with the headphones' key components. That's the way to do it. And that means ripping them apart. A ring of open-cell polyurethane foam just to provide cushioning. This type of foam is relatively inexpensive and used in all sorts of everyday objects, from sofas to bras. This is injection-moulded ABS, a good rigid industrial plastic. Also used to make Lego bricks, ABS, or acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, is strong, scratch-resistant and shock-absorbent. So that's just the housing. That's what makes this a closed-back headphone, that this part is a solid piece, this squidgy silicon piece. Give a bit of squish factor comfort. A cheap bit of plastic is actually an extraordinarily beautifully made thing. Oh, these ones are rather swish. For me, the over-ear style trumps the rest because it's the best way to achieve an immersive experience. So many parts to this intricacy. And high-spec ones like this really do come with all the trimmings. What have we got? On-off switch, lots of circuitry. These are clever pieces of electronics. Little microphone, so that's listening out into the world, picking up exterior noises, processing them and playing them back in to act as noise cancellation. The bit making the sound is housed under here. Yes! I think it could be time for a squeeze. I can see. Oh! And, oh, the driver. Suddenly, it does feel like finding treasure inside. This is the mini speaker that's inside every headphone. A driver is basically three things. A membrane, a coil of copper wire, and a magnet. The membrane is this crispy plastic film on the top here, and it's got that characteristic sound of someone trying to open sweets in the cinema. This membrane is called the diaphragm because just like the organ in our bodies, its job is to move in and out. Glued onto the diaphragm is the copper coil. And this coil, although it looks like one solid ring of copper, is in fact made of hundreds and hundreds of tiny loops of incredibly fine wire. And then there, that's the magnet in the middle. And the same is going on in the little earbuds. So here's the copper coil, and there it is. There's our tiny diaphragm. So this is really what makes the sound inside a headphone. Working out how to recreate something so intricate and technical is going to be key to my homemade headphones. But alongside the driver, I also want to investigate the connection and design my own bespoke casing. I'm starting with the toughest bit first, the driver. Right, first things first, and that's to centre the clay. Okay. I'm making a rudimentary prototype to get a better understanding of how they work. Now, to place the pipe. Ooh, crikey. Easy does it. Ooh. The top manufacturers spend millions on researching and developing their own proprietary materials and moulding them into the perfect driver shape. So can I actually reproduce sound using the most basic of ingredients? The temptation is to go really fast, but it's pulling it slightly off centre. Whoa, pay attention. My first task is the copper coil, a highly conductive metal wire that will carry the electrical signal from my audio device. I think that might be enough. There we go. The DIY copper coil, courtesy of the good old potter's wheel. Next, the diaphragm. 
the membrane that will move the air to create sound waves. For this, I've chosen a paper cup. Thin, lightweight material that will vibrate back and forwards. Finally, the magnet. I'm using a stack of mini magnets made from an iron alloy. If I just put one inside and then oh, the rest on the outside, orientate that into the middle, there we go. To complete the ensemble, my copper coil is going over the stack of magnets. When an electric current is passed through the coil, it becomes an electromagnet. And that magnetised field is going to move the magnets that are now in the core. That means the diaphragm moves in and out. And that movement is then going to move the air in the inside of this cup and send out sound waves. It's all about fluctuating currents. The electrical current travels around the copper coil. As it changes direction, the magnetic field it creates in turn repels and attracts the permanent magnet inside. Rapidly switching the direction of the current causes the permanent magnet to vibrate the paper cup. This generates pressure waves of sound that the inner ear converts into an electrical signal to send to the brain. And then hopefully I'll hear something. Right, plug this in. Right. Play. <gasps> <laughs> I can hear it. Not only can I hear it, I can feel the vibrations in my fingers. I'm going to put you in with my ear. I sort of can't believe that it works. It's just a paper cup, some copper wire and some magnets. And we have sound. I'm thrilled my rudimentary supplies worked on a basic level, but what materials do I need to ensure my headphones deliver a proper quality earful? One option could be an exciting substance that offers a revolutionary new way to produce sound. So this is our um, test room. I've come to the University of Hull to meet Professor Brian Smith. So if we just put some, some sound through that. Ooh. This is very unusual. This huge expanse of plasterboard is creating this incredible sound. But this whole surface is now the speaker. Because it's being vibrated by a small piece of matter hidden inside this box. It's got a surprising amount of bass. Somehow I wouldn't expect it. I want this at home, but I don't think my neighbours would like it. <laughs> this hefty material is called Turfinal D. Small pieces of this weighty stuff will turn any surface that can vibrate into a speaker, from a wall or table to the bone of your skull. I can feel the iron, that's heavy. Yeah, don't drop it. No. <laughs> it's a magnetic alloy that contains some very unusual metals. It's about 70% iron and about 30% um, dysprosium and terbium. So this is an entirely man-made synthetic block of rare earth material with iron? Correct. And what are the properties of this material that make it so extraordinary? You can control the length of it. So what happens is by, by exciting the magnetic field you can either make it longer or shorter. So you can actually change the shape of this with a magnetic field. It can be squeezed or stretched. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The beauty of Turfanor D is that just tiny changes in its shape can vibrate huge solid surfaces when held against them, turning entire rooms into speakers. It's a, a synthetic very, very reliable um, magnetic material that converts energy into physical movement. Very, very powerful. That, that piece would push probably 10 tonnes of, of, uh, of load quite easily. There's a huge amount of force can be generated by this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, a huge amount of force. This clever material also responds to a great range of frequencies from 0 hertz to 60 kilohertz within microseconds and never fatigues. So that ability to control the amplitude and the frequency, so not only how often it vibrates, but how much it vibrates. Yes, that gives you control over tone, it gives you control over volume, absolutely. It's very, very powerful and allows us to turn resonant surfaces into speakers very effectively. 
This material delivers a great quality sound on a big scale, but the team are also working hard on ways to scale the technology down. Can I listen to it? It would be good to... Yes, yes, of course. Let me just show you. Well, I can tell it's on because I can feel it in my hand, mm. but I can't... Very small vibration. Yeah. Mm. There it is. By putting a tiny piece of terfinal D inside an electromagnet... That's and good. then up, oh, and then up... Oh. Brian has produced a prototype headphone. Is it OK if I put it against my skull? Yeah. Well, you want to go in about here if you can, onto your mastoid. OK. This time, my skull is the resonant surface. Rather than sound waves travelling into my ear, they are vibrating through my bones directly to the inner ear. It's great. In fact, it's even better with my mouth wide open. This is known as bone conduction. Sadly, you can't hear what I'm hearing, as it's literally all inside my head. So I could really imagine headphones going down this route where the sound is kind of in you, but you're not blocking off your ears, you're not you know, preventing yourself from hearing the world around you. So say when you're cycling, you, you, you can hear traffic, but you still have good music playing. Mm. That's the kind of technology you need. Right now, Brian's innovative Turfinal D material is most impressive when it's massive. For me, the mini versions don't yet deliver that fully immersive experience I'm after. So for my headphones, it's back to the traditional drivers found in most commercial pairs. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Nice to see you. I've asked sound engineer Alex Paul to help me test the acoustic range produced by three different drivers. Do you want to put your headphones on so you can hear me? The proprietary materials and construction methods used in each one should result in different performances. And you can hear us OK, yeah? Yeah, I can. The first drivers are those of an expensive £200 pair of headphones. Next, the drivers inside an affordable £20 model. And last, but not least, my homemade paper cup driver. I want to see how it stands up against the professionally made ones. Homemade driver first. OK. This disembodied head is going to help us compare the different performance levels. OK, Alex, I'm ready. We're in position. Known as a binaural dummy, it has microphones in the ears, which will hopefully enable me to hear what human ears hear through headphones. Alex is measuring the output as each driver is being fed the same range of music and sounds. All right, head, brace yourself. This one's going to be loud. From a bit of heavy rock to our control sound, white noise. Now, let's have a look. Ooh. OK. So here we have a graph that shows us the white noise being played and recorded back in through the different pairs of headphones and your driver. White noise is made up of every frequency at an equal volume, making it an ideal control, showing how each driver works across the range of sounds we hear from the lowest to the highest frequencies. So this is like a piano, the low notes of this end, the high notes of this end. Exactly. And up here is amplitude, so this is loud sounds, quiet sounds. Absolutely. Okay. This graph isn't a timeline, but a snapshot of the whole recording. So the flat line is the white noise coming straight out of the computer, recorded back in without going through any headphones. So that is in its purest state. Um, and you can see it's an equal level all the way through at all frequencies. And then you can see the other lines, which are the white noise being recorded back in after going through the headphones, have been affected quite a lot. And the white line, I'm going to assume that's my... Homemade driver. Yes. It hasn't even met the blue is. line in any place. No. It's losing quite a lot of energy through some of the materials. And also, you can see there's some quite big scoops out of some of the frequencies. Yeah, there's Scoop. a big scoop there. Yeah, and... Uh, and the bass as well. Absolutely. <laughs> this means that some frequencies have been lost in translation. Unsurprisingly, my rudimentary magnet and coil combination isn't reproducing the full range of sounds. And on top of that, the paper material of the cup is a poor acoustic insulator. But how have the other two fared? The less expensive and the more expensive headphones are similar, but you can see the less expensive headphones are still lacking in the bass department. Represented by the orange line, there's a visible dip for the cheaper pair when it comes to the lower notes. One tiny point, my... Homemade driver actually beats it. Yep, I would say <laughs> on a very slim, on a very slim point. The green line, representing the expensive pair, more closely follows the original sound around the bass frequencies. 
interestingly, both shop-bought pairs are actively boosting higher frequencies, leaving my DIY driver for dust. The areas where it goes above the blue line, mm -hmm. that's where the manufacturers have decided we want our headphones to perform, well, overperform in this area. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, different headphones, different speakers will all have their own natural frequency response, which is either as a result of the materials used, the, the manufacturing methods, or just how they want those headphones and the speakers to sound. So some clear differences between the three drivers. But how do these variations impact their output when it comes to music? This is our source sound. So, as you'd expect, and if we move over to the homemade driver, I mean, it's okay, there. Well, it's like someone playing it in another room. It is, but and you, know, you want to bang on the wall, go turn that down. Absolutely, not... but, but you've still, you know, you've still managed to create a speaker that produces the sound. It's a little disappointing, but with such basic materials and homespun techniques, it's to be expected. Next, it's the turn of the twenty-pound pair. So you can hear the kind of. It's a lot of top. Yeah, a lot of a lot of top, a lot of sort of upper mid range and, and, and less bass. So it kind of sounds a little bit tinny. Mm -hmm. And then if we move to the more expensive headphones. That's really interesting because visually the cheap and the expensive headphones don't look so different on the graph, yeah. but as soon as you play it, that's much more like the source track. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd almost say you get what you pay for then. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, the more expensive headphones definitely give you a, a truer reproduction of that source sound. Well, at least that leaves me in little doubt. I'll need something a lot more sophisticated than a paper cup. As well as a really brilliant driver, I also want my headphones to have a reliable connection to the sound source. One of the biggest changes in headphone connectivity has come about in the last 25 years. Whilst the good old wire is always a faithful bet, actually many people are now opting for the freedom of the wireless connection. This is most often achieved using Bluetooth, which harnesses low power microwaves to enable your two devices to talk to each other. Microwaves are electromagnetic waves, like visible light, only with a lower frequency, thus can't be seen by the human eye. Unlike sound waves, which travel by vibrating air molecules, they transfer energy as radiation and can travel in a vacuum. These waves, they're actually the same as the sort of waves you use in a microwave oven to cook your food. And there's a simple way to prove this. This object is designed to keep the waves in, so there's a Faraday cage around it. There's a wire mesh that essentially stops that certain frequency of microwave getting out. If I pair this Bluetooth speaker with my phone in the same way I would with headphones, and then pop it in the oven. Don't try this at home. When the door's open, the Bluetooth signal can enter freely, but when I close the door, hopefully, it's then blocked. <laughs> As Bluetooth waves are far less powerful than those used in a microwave oven, they don't have harmful effects. They do, however, operate at the same frequency, so this Faraday cage has the same blocking effect. Fundamentally, this cage is preventing the Bluetooth speaker connecting with my phone. A microwave oven is not the only thing that can interfere with Bluetooth. Water, be it rain or a damp atmosphere, can break up or entirely block the signal. So my other option is the trusty old cable. There's enough more than I can chew. But what's actually going on inside? There is the copper wire. Bit of a trend for fabric-coated wires at the moment. I imagine very much they're going to be the same. Ooh, there's copper in this. Silicon sheath. But yeah, they are all copper. Then we've got three wires. The red for the right channel, blue for the left channel, and there's the copper for the ground. Each wire is individually coated in a microscopic layer of clear or coloured plastic to stop them making contact and short-circuiting the cable. It's no surprise to me that all of these wires are copper because copper is such a fantastic conductor of electricity. 
all metals, to a certain extent, conduct electricity, but some do it far better than others. Silver is also a great conductor because, like copper, it has these free electrons that can move very freely in the material, but it's very expensive in comparison to copper, though copper is still valuable, and you can see just how small an amount of it is inside these wires. Beautiful. Personally, I love a cable. Bluetooth is a great technology, but the signal can be patchy. And for me, I take comfort in being physically connected. It's a sense of being tethered. It's almost sort of an umbilical cord to the sound. And the challenge of making my own cable, yeah, that excites me. OK, so inside my cable will be four individual copper wires. To the left ear, which is this ear, I need one cable. To the right ear, I need one. Each of these wires take the signal from the device up to the ear cup, and both will need a ground wire to bring it back down to complete the circuit. It's a slight twist. That's going to encourage the two wires to come together. My next challenge is to coat them. I'm going to use a material called Plasti Dip. Lovely stuff. Plasti Dip is a PVC based paint that's incredibly useful for electrical parts, ensuring they are insulated. Ooh, ooh, yes. When it dries, it gives a flexible, rubbery finish. People even thin it down with a bit of terps and spray cars with it to give a kind of strange, matte, pimped aesthetic. I need to build it up layer by layer. There's something rather gruesome about this, like blood-stained, splattered sinews. Ooh. Before joining the two separate cables together at one end. So this half will remain separate, but now I want this end of the cable to become one. Now, I could be cleaning up these drops and smoothing it out, but I'm tempted to keep them as a sort of mark of the making process. Like it says, this was once a liquid, it did drip. It also indicates this is not factory made, this is done by a person. Time to let that dry. Oh, hang on. Drippage. Maybe don't want that one yet. Last on my to-do list, the casings, where both style and substance come into play. From the aesthetics that make a statement about who we are, to how form and design impacts the fit and, crucially, the performance. Hi, Zoe. Hi, Andy. Thanks so much for having me. No problem at all. To find out just how much impact the design of my headphones could have on the sound... And then we're looking, essentially, for the sensor of your ear canal. I've come to meet product marketing manager Andy Kerr at high-end headphones manufacturers Bowes & Wilkins. I've got lopsided ears. Congratulations, 127 both sides. Of the four models of headphones they produce here, each one is carefully considered to give the user a different listening experience. And when it comes to the ear cups, it's about more than just looks. These are actually surprisingly diddy. So that's the kind of thing, if you were travelling, if you wanted something easy to fold up and put away in your bag, that's the perfect choice. But as you can see, the result of that is it sits on your ear mm -hmm. and it doesn't fully encapsulate your whole ear. Uh, the other side of the coin is something like that. This is the kind of headphone that goes completely over your ear, what we would call circumoral. Uh, that last design is super oral, so it sits on your ear. Immediately, you can feel now that you're kind of more uh, inside a room, inside a space, so to speak. Pardon? <laughs> you're creating a controlled space here with yes. this padding. Every material used is analysed to understand how it impacts the experience of sound, right down to the foam. It has to be able to press consistently across the whole area around your ear and try and cut down sound transfer from the outside walls. The memory foam in the Circum Oral headphones reacts to pressure and heat, creating not just a comfortable fit, but also an acoustic seal. So something like this would actually mould to your ear and have less bounce to it, whereas this one would mould to your ear, but at the same time it's wanting to bounce off. Yeah, I, I mean, on a very simple level, any, any bounce breaks the acoustic seal. It kind of uh, is a bit like imagining you're in a room playing music and then you open the door and, and suddenly you're changing the air pressure or the characteristics of the air within that room. So what we're trying to do is, is as best as we possibly can, place you in the environment that the headphones are creating and then seal you within that. But we also don't want to do it in a way that becomes kind of oppressive, uncomfortable, 
uh, hot, uh, all those sorts of things. There's foam here and then it hits something hard. So it's about 50% foam and about 50% essentially a kind of a defined acoustic space, which is the area that I've now got my fingers on. That's really nice. So this whole ear cup isn't just a comfortable pad, it's also a spacer that puts the driver at the optimum distance from your ear. Yeah. Another essential component in the outer design is the headband. And in this high-spec model, that's made of aluminium. So this is your heaviest set? Correct, yeah. Using aluminium, I guess it adds some robustness, but is it adding anything to the performance of the headphone? You absolutely do. So you're trying to control resonances uh, moving through the headband, uh, moving from one side of the enclosure to the other one. Uh, so a stiff material helps from that point of view. However well-crafted these outer casings are, they're worthless without an equally well-designed driver inside. So this is fundamentally trying to meet both requirements of being able to move very rapidly and also have a degree of what we would refer to as excursion or air moving capability. So to achieve that, we're using a material which has a kind of optimised mixture of the two. So as you can oh. feel, it's relatively speaking uh, quite light. It's relatively speaking quite stiff. If you look at it as well, if you very gently push down on there, you can feel there's a suspension system. So you're combining the stiffness of this almost paper-like cone with the travel of this flexible edge. Exactly. This is so beautiful. It's so delicate. I can hear it almost sounds like paper and feels like paper, but I can tell it has a stiffness unlike any paper I've ever experienced that's this thin. This exact material and construction technique is a closely guarded secret, but very kindly, Andy has given me a pair of their drivers to use in my DIY headphones. But it's the design of the ear cups that has really caught my attention. It's not just a way of putting a speaker to your ear, it's a way of creating a whole world, this room that each ear has. That's there not just to sort of provide some rigidity to the shape, but actually to act as a spacer keeping the speaker kind of the optimum distance from your ear. And this is a really controlled playing field for sound. But there may be a way for me to hear the sound from my player without the need for outer casings or ear cups at all. I've come to the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research at the University of Southampton to experience it for myself. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a great space. <laughs> this is an anechoic chamber, a room where all surfaces, walls, ceiling and floor, absorb rather than reflect sound waves. <laughs> That's so unusual. Anechoic comes from the Greek, ana meaning without, choic meaning echo, so without echo and absolutely dead, nothing. I'm here to meet Professor Filippo Farzi. Filippo, nice to meet you. Hi, Roy. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research. Thanks for having me. Filippo is an expert in the science of directional sound. Oh, and what's this? What we have here is a loudspeaker array. So it is a device that includes 24 identical loudspeakers. And we're going to use them not to make a louder sound, but to create some very interesting interference of waves in space. So if you could stand over there. Right, there we go. I'm going to generate now three different sound beams, one directed toward the centre, one directed toward the left, and another one directed toward the right. And each sound beam will deliver an independent audio signal. So you're going to tell me what you hear. Feel free to walk around and experience this demo. Ready? Yep, ready. Let's go with the sounds. Oh, music. Here we've got some strings and piano. Pretty loud classical music. Bit of R and B, completely different sound. Wow. Okay, back to the classical, and then here, folk. This is really strange. It's like I've just walked through three rooms, and each one is playing different music. When sound leaves a speaker, it travels out in a widening cone shape. So playing different tracks in the same room should be cacophonous. That's amazing. I can't hear the other music at all. But the signals driving this array of speakers are designed so that the sound waves each generate either combine to create louder sounds or cancel each other out to create quiet zones. It's a technique known as beamforming. 
It's a completely different party here to here. As the room isn't reflecting sound back, I'm hearing the effect in its purest form. That's really impressive. Is there a place where you can imagine this replacing headphones? Yes, yes. And one of the most interesting ones that we are working on now is in the car environment. So ideally, the holy grail of this technology is to create independent sound zone for every person sitting in the car. So, for example, whilst the driving is, uh, driver is having a phone call, the passenger could listen to some music and on the back seats, the kids could watch a movie. So in fact, you can have four people all listening to something different. Exactly. But Filippo and his team aren't stopping at in-car entertainment. They're also working on a system that could allow my personal sound bubble to travel around with me. So what you see here is a loudspeaker array, now includes in this case seven loudspeakers, but it also has a little camera in here. Hello. <laughs> so what is really interesting now is that the camera is tracking where you are, and more specifically, it follows your ears, it knows exactly where your ears are. That's the little red marks. Yes, exactly, exactly. We are now combining computer vision together with the beamforming technology we you experienced earlier on. But instead of sending sound beams in different positions to space, we are sending independent sound to your left and right ear. OK, I'm ready. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> oh, I'm in Jurassic Park. This is very disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> One just came close to me. <laughs> wow. In everyday life, our ears pick up on various differences that allow us to judge where sounds are coming from by registering the different times it takes for sound from a single source to reach each ear. That's very strange. This ear tracking technology is delivering the same 3D stereo sound sensation even when I move. If I was to duck and swoop quickly, the sound does not change. The sound isn't just here, it's also here and here and down there and all around me. That's incredible. How was it that I could hear you know, a dinosaur on the floor, one up behind me, yet all the speakers are directly in front of me? Well, if you think about it, we hear with our two ears. So if you are capable of delivering the correct signal to your left ear and the correct different signal to your right ear, then you can create any acoustic illusion. This technology is called binaural sound. This phenomenon can be achieved with headphones as different signals can be directed into our left and right ears via an earpiece. But incredibly, I'm experiencing the same effect without the need to wear any. It really was as close to a headphone type experience as I've ever had without wearing headphones in that it was like something's going in the left, something's going in the right and it's completely all-encompassing surround sound type experience very intimate, yet I can also still hear the room. This, we believe, is the future of headphones, which is having headphones without wearing headphones. That is impressive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> More. The remarkable combination of directional sound paired with the tracking tech could transform portable sound as we know it. I mean, imagine if it was a brooch or something you just wore like a necklace, very delicate, discreet, yet provided this localised sound bubble around your head. It would be amazing. This really shows what the future holds for personalised audio. But for me, it's all about the sensory experience the physical chamber of an ear cup can create. Taking inspiration from my visit to the headphone manufacturer, I want to make a cup that's the right shape for me. Right, there's something I'd like to try. That means getting hands on. I think there's a kind of relationship between the ear and the hand. And I'm wondering if that shape, that cup that our hands make when we're cupping them over our ears, might be the ideal shape for a headphone cup. So in order to capture that shape, I'm going to try and form it out of clay. That shape is now capturing the negative space in the cup of my hand. Look quite headphone -y already in a strange way. Right, to the vac former. Now, 
This is a vacuum formation machine, and it works by heating up sheet material like this. This is a thermosoft polymer. The bonds between the long chain molecules inside thermosoft plastics like this are relatively weak, so when heated, they move over each other and the material softens. Heat. Making it easy to mould. Oh, it's exciting. Pulse ready. OK. Vacuum on. As I pull the lever, it raises the clay mould yes. up and a vacuum sucks the softened plastic down. Oh, there's something of the alien about it. Making it fit precisely over the contours of the shape. Now we're talking. It's got incredible resolution. I can see the lines and the wrinkles, almost the fingerprints. Pleased with that. Right, time to cut them out. It's quite headphony. There's plenty of space for my ear. It's just whether there's enough space for all the gubbins that I need to put inside. With my cups in hand, I want to turn my attention to those innards. Can I transform my listening experience with noise cancellation? All of these facilities were built in the 1960s. Professor Steve Elliott from the University of Southampton has spent the last 30 years researching ways of using opposing sound waves to reduce extraneous noise in loud environments. Steve and his team have made this amazing space. This is not a Cold War torture chamber. This is a space designed to simulate the cabin of an aircraft. And have I sit myself down? Right, I'm ready. So what I'm going to show you, Zoe, is the sound that is made by a propeller aircraft. So we're going to use one of these loudspeakers to make this loud, low-frequency noise that propellers would make. It is oh, it's very thick, low, making me feel a bit nauseous. Oh, I'd feel quite sick after a while listening to this. And I think particularly over a long period of time, then it's really quite uncomfortable and wearing. The microphones hanging from the ceiling are picking up this unpleasant sound. So this is the waveform of the pressure from one of these microphones that you can see uh, is being generated. The sound recorded by the microphones is being manipulated by Steve's apparatus. When this noise is played back out through the extra set of speakers, it should make a difference to what I hear. So if I speak and turn the cancellation on, then it's now a lot quieter then these loudspeakers are trying to cancel the sound out at all of these microphone positions uh, and make the noise as quiet as we possibly can. So much nicer. <laughs> do it again, do it again. So this is okay. with no cancellation. So this is the loud booming noise and that's with the cancellation on. Steve, show me what was going on there. To try to generate a sound field that cancelled out the one that we've just generated representing the, the, the propellers. So this array of microphones is constantly monitoring the sound in the cabin? Yeah, the green line here is the waveform which is representing the propeller noise, and the blue line here is the signal which is being driven to one of the loudspeakers in order to cancel it. So the green line is the original noise that's the problem, and the blue line is our counteracting solver of the problem. It, exactly. This counteractive sound wave is like a mirror image of the original sound wave. When they are played together, they cancel each other out, a phenomenon known as destructive interference. It's extraordinarily counterintuitive to think to get rid of a sound, you need to play more sound. That idea of cancellation of one pressure by another pressure is exactly the same thing that you would get in a, in a headset in order to generate uh, the quiet in the headset as well. Active noise cancellation headphones like these work in a very similar way to the kit in Steve's mock aircraft cabin. You've got the little microphone listening to the outside world and that signal is then processed and pumped back into the ear via the speaker to cancel out that extraneous external noise. So neat. This is a pretty sophisticated way of electronically reducing noise levels, but it is possible to go back to basics and use the very physical properties of materials themselves to reduce extraneous noise. To achieve the best possible results in my headphones, I'm going to road test three very different noise-reducing materials. 
For this experiment, I need three identical boxes fitted with three identical microphones. Let's double check that this is a good fit. That's nice. Ta -da! I'm going to line each box with a different material. This stuff, this is mass loaded vinyl. So this is a, a vinyl sheet, but it's crammed full of calcium carbonate or barium sulfate. And those powders make this a very, very dense form of PVC. This stuff is so dense, it barely vibrates, which means it will dampen rather than nice. conduct sound. On you go. I'm going to let that dry. In the meantime, I'm going to cut the acoustic foam. My next material is polyurethane foam, normally used to line the walls of recording studios. That may well just fit perfectly. Ah, easy, it doesn't even need glue. In contrast to the mass-loaded vinyl, the foam has a low density. The open, flexible cell structure acts as a natural sound wave absorber. It's already a bit like a teeny tiny recording studio. My final sound blocking substance is called green glue. Popular for home renovations, it's a viscoelastic polymer that stays in a semi-liquid state and converts mechanical sound waves into heat. It's to go between two hard surfaces, so this box is a perfect mini version of that setup. Give it a little wobble, let it bed in. Right, stop fiddling. In you go. Ooh. With my microphones all carefully sealed in, I'm ready to hit the streets. OK, so I've built this rig so that I can simultaneously record on these four microphones onto the four track recorder. The fourth box contains a naked microphone to act as a control and record the true noise levels. Off to one of London's busiest streets, Tottenham Court Road. I'm determined to give them a good workout with as many loud noises as I can find. I'd like someone to beat their horn. Beat the horn! Go on, beat your horn for me. <laughs> The more effective the material, the less ambient noise should reach the microphones. OK, so let's listen to the results now. OK, so the general noise of the street is really clear. Here's track two, the exposed microphone. That's great, because it's clearly reading a much higher level than the other three. In fact, if I mute track two, I sort of barely hear anything. The first thing to note is all of the boxes that are supposed to acoustically insulate actually are doing that. They seem to be relatively similar, but on occasion there's peaking from this one. If any of them were the weaker, I'd say it's the mass-loaded vinyl. Let's see if we can hear when someone beats their horn. Go on, beat your horn for me. <laughs> yeah. At that moment of the horn sounding, this one obviously peaks the most, but then the second is this one. And in fact, the least sound was heard in this box. So first place goes to the green glue, closely followed by the acoustic foam. Bottom of the pile, with the poorest soundproofing, is the mass-loaded vinyl. But there are other factors to consider. Problem is, each of these materials have other advantages and disadvantages. This one's very, very heavy, and on headphones it might just be too heavy. This one, although it's the best acoustically, I mean, it's still sticky. I'm not sure it's suitable for having near your hair. And then this is so lightweight and easy just to fill any crevice with. It would be good to use some of that. So judging by performance and practicality, the acoustic foam is the best material for me. Now it's time for the fun bit, constructing the final elements of my bespoke headphones. This is a perfect example of a clamping force. This hair clip uses a clamping force to bring together these teeth. The structural spine that will hold everything together is the headband, and I have a slightly out there idea to stop my hair getting squashed. Could I make 
like a giant headband that brought the cups down like this. And maybe the whole band was so big it never touched my hair anyway. I'm using aluminium because it's lightweight, yet still strong and has some elasticity. Inside all metals is a crystalline structure. There's granules and we may be able to hear those grains crunching over each other. Here we go. Yeah, it's a kind of soft, crunchy sound. To hear there's just not enough force to kind of like hold it in place. But if I made it out of one continuous piece of aluminium, I might have the clamping force I need. I want something quite high off the head. Well, the clamping force is good. The band is attached to plywood driver mounts using rivet joints. There we go. Check it's pivoting nicely. Yep. Starting to feel a bit headphony. How am I looking? I've borrowed a friend's hands to make larger ear cups, which get glued onto the plywood. Right, just gotta let that dry. They're packed with the soundproofing polyurethane foam. Bad. Driver. Before I click in that all important centerpiece, the precision engineered driver. That's good. To provide a bit of cushioning and to create an acoustic space around my ear. That's the hole. Yeah, that's a good fit, actually. I'm using memory foam padding covered in super smooth silk. So silky dilky and slippy dippy. It's got such a low coefficient of friction, which makes it a real devil to sew. Ooh, right. Last but not least, the crucial connections for my homemade cable. Oh, oh it moved. Classic. It's like the ultimate steady hand game. I'm soldering mini jacks on each end to feed into my phone and the ear cups. Here we go. And if I touch the right point, oh, da -da, we have live contact. Phew. OK. All that remains is to see if it works. Final moments of assembly. Let's get these micro jacks in place. Right, that's that end in. Other end into the phone. On they go. Feel good. Not touching the hair and play. <gasps> OK, they're working. That's the first thing. We have music. Let me get you in on the action. I feel great. Very quickly, I'm not thinking about headphones at all, it's just an immersive experience. And all this gubbins, all this technology, all this craft and design disappears into the background and it becomes about the music. I mean, they probably look ridiculous, but I don't care. If you want to explore further, watch additional experiments and learn more about material properties and design thinking, go to the address on screen and follow the links to the Open University.